Thank you, Jim. That's a very nice job. I loved your story. <laughs> George, I thought that was a very nice report about our money. And where'd George go? There he is. What for how it's used and all that kind of stuff. George just doesn't know when to be quiet, does he? <laughs> he last week offended members of our class who are Notre Dame fans. And last today he offended those of us who are UT fans. Like for nothing, George. <laughs> Sing gloom, despair, and agony on me, but I'll just transfer my hanks to George. <laughs> May not be a lot of money off the back row this year. I called my son last night, and I have for him a huge money making opportunity t shirts and bumper stickers that have printed on them waiting for Peyton. <laughs> started that 50 years ago. It's amazing to have such a genius at five years old. <laughs> we appreciate that. And all that we're doing with Camp Lookout is just wonderful, and we're glad that we have people that have been away who are back. Uh, this lesson was not written after last night's football camp. Uh, I have been working on this for about a month. So there's a little bit more packed into it than probably needs to be, but I will hope for your forbearance as we kind of, kind of dig our way through it. Uh, I hope in the end it's saying something that's very important that you might think about trying this week in some way. I start the lesson off by saying that there are some interesting consistencies that are found in the life of Jesus that occur in situations where he has great stress and great demand. And in these situations, Jesus does something time and again, almost unexpectedly, that maybe we can learn a lesson from. In Matthew 15, Jesus is out wandering through the countryside with his disciples, and a woman comes running up to him and breaks into the circle that surrounds him, his entourage, and she begins to scream out about her daughter, and her daughter is very, very sick. Her daughter is, in some people's minds, possessed by a demon. Suddenly there is great chaos, suddenly there is great stress, suddenly there is great demand to be placed on Jesus. And Matthew 15 says that Jesus did not say a word. In the 15th chapter of Mark, Mark's Gospel records one of those first moments in which Jesus is taken by the Jewish leaders and the leaders of the synagogue and they are brought into Pilate. And all of a sudden in that moment there is Pilate not knowing what to do. There is his wife running her mouth. There are the Jewish leaders running theirs. And Pilate goes on a tirade and a lecture and a belittling and a put down of Jesus. And Mark 15 says, that Jesus did not say a word. In Matthew 27, which probably is reflecting on a second interview of Pilate with Jesus, Pilate comes before Jesus and he's calmed down a little bit now and now a little bit more like a leader, he begins to issue all of the different charges that have been brought against Jesus and begins to give Jesus a chance to respond to those charges. And Matthew 27 says Jesus gave no answer, not to any of the charges. And finally in John 8, we know that famous story of the woman who is caught in the act of adultery. And she is drugged by a crowd of righteous people before Jesus to try to put Jesus on the spot to see what he will do. As you know, they have their stones in their hands and they're ready to stone her. And in the midst of the cries of the crowd, the Bible says that Jesus bent down and began to doodle in the ground, not saying a word. <coughs> Something that's very interesting, I wish you'd go listen to. In the 1930s, uh, the American musicologist uh, uh, Alan Lomax and his brother John went throughout the American South with primitive recording devices recording the music that they found in the back country of the South. They believed that maybe literacy was coming, 
that still may be open to question in some circles, but that if they didn't capture some of that old music, that it would get lost somehow in the way that cultures move. And so some of the most important spiritual, some of the most important jazz, some of the most important music that came out of the old south of America was captured by these men and is now archived in the Smithsonian. And it becomes a remarkable history or part of it of that time in our country. Finally, the Lomaxes ended up in uh, Angola Prison in Louisiana, which was then and may still be one of the worst places in the world. But they went there because they had heard that in Angola they had a wonderful prison choir. And that at special times they'd put these prisoners in ball and chain and send them out into the community and would allow them to sing and that their singing was really, really good. And so the Lomaxes says, we, we don't have a lot of recording energy. We don't have a lot of recording device. We've probably got room for one song what is your most important song? And I'll bet some of you will remember this old spiritual. That prison choir of harsh men whose lives were even harsher stood up and sang with great, great beauty, and he never said a mumbling word. Do you remember that? He never said a mumbling word. And I don't know if that was reflective of their lives in some way and what they didn't have as options in their lives, but they certainly captured something of the spirit of Jesus in times of great stress and in great demand. Jesus never said a mumbling word. <clears throat> Chester Nimitz is a person that people of our generation would readily recognize. Chester Nimitz became the naval commander who led the American naval efforts in the Pacific War in World War II. Nimitz was one of the few people to ever be awarded the title Fleet Admiral, which is equivalent to an Eisenhower-like five-star general in the Army. Nimitz's story is really kind of interesting, and of course it is heroic. Uh, Nimitz was born in Fredericksburg, Texas, not the kind of place where you would expect <laughs> that someone who would ever leave any naval area would uh, be involved with. He was pretty smart in school, and he got a competitive scholarship to the Naval Academy. Uh, he was uh, born before the beginning of the 20th century, and so he was able to serve on one kind of naval vessel or another during World War I, and then after World War I led, led the U.S. naval efforts in establishing a, a submarine command. Uh, the longer that Nimitz was around, the more that people recognized him as a brilliant strategy person and a person that knew how to keep his calm under difficult circumstances. And so by the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor, Nimitz is in Washington working in a kind of a middle-level command, having been recognized as somebody that if you wanted something done, give it to Chester uh, Nimitz. The week of Pearl Harbor, he gets a call, and on the other end of the phone is Franklin Roosevelt. And Franklin Roosevelt says to Nimitz, uh, there is a plane waiting for you. Go to that plane as quickly as you can. Fly to San Diego. There will be another plane waiting for you. Get out to Pearl Harbor. Figure out what happened, but more importantly, figure out what we're going to do next. And he placed Nimitz in command of the American war effort. In terms of the chain of command, Franklin Roosevelt passed over 20 higher-ranking admirals to get to Nimitz. That doesn't happen much, does it, Jim? He passed over 20, and Nimitz was the person. What's interesting to me, though, was the response on the other end of the phone. Nimitz said this, no, Mr. President, I'm going to go home and get me a good night's sleep. And then in the morning, I'm going to get on a train. And I'm going to wait, make my way across this country. It'll probably take about a week. And then when I get to San Diego, maybe I'll be ready to go to Hawaii and understand what happened and understand what we needed to do. Franklin Roosevelt had such great regard for Nimitz in his own mind that he made no objection 
And Nimitz went home that night and slept all night, got up the next morning and caught the train and took a week going to San Diego. Now, I will tell you that along the way at every major stop, he made arrangements for naval officers to bring him reports and to stay with him. Most of the people that he picked up along the way became his naval staff. But by the time he got to San Diego, he was ready to get on the plane and figure out what to do in the movements of the Second World War in that region. Now what Jesus did, never saying a mumbling word. And what Nimitz did, getting a good night's rest and taking a long train ride through the country, seems almost totally un-American to us, doesn't it? As Americans, we say, don't just stand there, do something. But it almost seems like that Jesus was moving, at least in some ways, in a different direction. It's interesting that that great guru, Siddhartha Gautama, who we call the Buddha, at one point famously said, don't just do something, stand there. They're standing there and being quiet and not saying a word might have some viability that sometimes the noisiness of our lives and the noisiness of our world seems to forget. I wonder if you remember Daniel Berrigan. If you remember Daniel Berrigan, you probably remember him as a Jesuit priest who was very active in the protest against the Vietnam War uh, back in its midst. Berrigan ultimately served time in prison because of his protest against the war in Vietnam. But long before he was a war protester and long before he was a political activist, Berrigan decided that he needed to give his life to God and he became a Jesuit priest. As a young priest, just at the very beginning of his life, uh, Berrigan was assigned to Calvary Hospital in the Bronx in New York, which back in the 1960s when all of this happened would have been a really painfully awful, terrible place uh, uh, to be. It was a place where people that had nothing went to get help, and more times than not, where people that had nothing went to die. And Berrigan takes his orders, and that becomes his first assignment. He talks about a man named Tom, and he talks about the way that this man named Tom made an indelible impression upon his life. Tom had been uh, uh, sent to the Bronx Hospital, and the doctors were saying that his, tra his tra uh, tra uh, I'm trying to say the word, trajectory, trajectory, can I say that three times real fast? <laughs> that his trajectory was declining. That was their word for he was dying. I, I feel like that sometimes, don't you? Don't you feel like you're sometimes your trajectory is declining? But at any rate, this guy was dying. And so Berrigan, the young priest, goes in and wants to do everything for him that he can possibly do. And so he ministers to all of his needs. He prays for him every day. He has in his heart the kind of young priest belief that if he does enough and if he prays enough, maybe the trajectory of this man's life might change, but he moves on closer and closer to death. Finally, Daniel Berrigan says he comes into Tom's room and he's maybe two days away from dying. And he keeps frenetically almost saying, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? What can I do for you? And finally, this man says very quietly, Father, I don't need you to do anything for me. If you could sit here with me and just be still and quiet with me, that would be better than anything. Berrigan says it was the most important lesson of his whole life, and he never forgot it. <clears throat> In 1614, in the back country of France, 1614, most of France was probably back country. There was a guy born by the name of Nicholas Herman. And he was born into a very terrible circumstance of poverty and want and, and need. 
about the only thing that he could do by the time that he gets to be about 17 or 18 years of age that will give him a chance is join the army. And at that time, France was engaged in the Thirty Years' War, and lots of people were being killed. And so uh, to have someone come and volunteer to join the army, that, that was very positive. And so he went right in. He was fed better than he'd ever been fed. He was paid a little bit of a stipend. And so things were probably uh, looking up for Nicholas Hermann. But on one of his early marches, he and his company of men are captured by a group of German soldiers. And they kind of think that these guys are spies. And they kind of think that maybe Nicholas Herman is one of the leaders of the spy group. And so they begin to persecute him. And they begin to threaten him. And they begin to torture him. And they began to hurt and maim him in ways that left scars and impediments in his life for the rest of his life. But almost like Jesus, before his captors, before the crucifixion, there was a peacefulness about this man. There was a serenity about this man. There was a composure about this man that even the German prosecutors couldn't understand. And so at the end of all the harm that they could dish out, instead of deciding to kill him like they did most of the time, they let him go. A few years later, not knowing what to do with his life, somewhat recovered from his injuries, he shows up at a Carmelite priory in Paris, and he believes that God wants him to become a minister, a priest. He has no education and no prospects of that, and so he can't become a full priest. But they decide that if he'll come in as a lay minister, that they will accept him, and he becomes a Carmelite monk. He spends the rest of his life not on some glorious mission trip and not preaching from some high pulpit. He spends the rest of his life as a cook in the kitchen although his notes say that he didn't particularly like cooking for the rest of the priory. As a sandal maker, that was what he graduated up to, and finally before he died as the wine buyer for the priory. Not very good jobs. Not something that would give somebody a lot of acclaim. But the people of Paris knew Nicholas Ehrman. As Brother Lawrence, his Carmelite name. And they knew him as a man of great peace and serenity and joy. And when they were around him, they felt like they were almost in the presence of God. And toward the end of his life, people began to ask Brother Lawrence how it was that he had been able to take all of the things of life that had come his way how it was that he had been able to meet all the demand and the stress of his life that had come. And Brother Lawrence said, it was the insight that came in my conversion experience. Now that's what I want you to dwell on for a minute. The insight that came in my conversion experience. Now that stopped me for a little bit. Because the way I was raised to think about conversion was I was raised to think about somebody that had done a bunch of sinning and done a bunch of things wrong and they came before God and said they were sorry and begged God's forgiveness and they were converted to a higher, better way of living. I do think that that fits a lot of situations, but I'm not sure it fits every situation. I remember going forward in a Baptist church at nine years of age to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And the preacher said, do you want to go to heaven? Well, of course I wanted to go to heaven. Are you kidding me? Do you believe in Jesus? What nine-year-old raised in a Baptist church would say anything, but yeah, I believe in Jesus. And then the preacher said, are you sorry for all your sins? And that stumped me just a little bit because frankly, as a nine-year-old, I'm not sure that list was very long. So you see, I'm not sure how being sorry for sins always applies to a conversion experience. 
And Brother Lawrence didn't say he was sorry for sins. Brother Lawrence says that at his conversion, he gained an insight that sustained him for the rest of his life. wonder if conversion could be that as well. wonder if conversion could be gaining some insight that could sustain us for the rest of our lives. Let me tell you about his conversion experience. And I really want you to contemplate this. Brother Lawrence says that it was in that 30 years war and that he was out on a part of a God-forsaken battlefield. It had been bombed, it had been shelled, it had been shot over, it had been blown up in every way that things could be blown up. It was blood-covered armies that raced back and forth across this area literally for years. And he was sitting out there. It was also winter time. And he said it was bitterly, harshly cold. Almost too cold to snow, although it was snowing a little bit. And he was sitting out there. He said in front of him was a tree. A big old tree. And that tree had been scarred by bullets. That tree had blood spotches on it. That tree had any semblance of leaves ripped all off of it. That tree had ice on it from the cold of the winter. That tree was just sitting out there, stark and sterile, and as dead looking as everything about that landscape. Brother Lawrence said he looked at the tree came to him that no matter how sterile and quiet and absent, no matter how uncommunicative, no matter how dead looking, that deep within that tree there was life. And that if he could just wait, that before long that tree would bud and before long, that tree would have leaves. And before long, that tree would have flowers. And before long, that tree would have fruit and would nurture the world with its beauty if he could wait. And this illiterate man said that suddenly he had the insight that's exactly what God is like sometimes. Far removed, not talking, not able to contact easily, sterile, away. But if we can wait, there is life there. And if we can wait, that life will bud and there will be leaves and there will be flowers and there will be fruit. Yes, there is winter, but if we can wait, there will be spring. And Brother Lawrence said for the rest of his life that he practiced the presence. I've been thinking a lot about that. <coughs> Maybe there are times in which God seems like that tree in winter. And maybe there are times in which God seems as distant for one reason or another as that tree seemed dead. But maybe sometimes if we could learn to wait and maybe sometimes if we could learn to practice the presence of God, then we might become aware of the life that is there and the spring that is before it and the goodness that's still yet to come. 
I believe that we've learned a lot about praying for things that we want. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because many times the praying for the things we want is not selfish. It's prayers on the behalf of people we love and situations that we wish could be better or different for those we love. Sometimes prayer involves a lot of talking on our end and the hope and faith of a lot of listening on God's end. But I wonder if sometimes our praying could not simply be just silence and just quiet and not saying a mumbling word and somehow in whatever ways that we humble ourselves before God or in some way in whatever way we bow ourselves before God that we might simply pray and wait and pray and be quiet and pray and open ourselves to the presence of God that might dawn in our lives. The whole key may be to wait without giving up, without jumping to any kind of conclusions, without being too quick with our assumptions, without having to understand, without having to have some answer, without having to have some explanation that makes sense to us. Maybe sometimes we put so many demands on prayer with so many assumptions, with wanting everything to make sense, that we don't give God a chance to surround us with his presence and his power and his love. And in our waiting, the budding presence of a living God may come into our awareness and still be enough to sustain us. Isaiah wrote, we look for light but behold darkness. We walk in gloom, though we look for brightness. We grope for the wall like the blind. We stumble at noon as in the twilight. We look for salvation, but it seems so far from us. Then Isaiah says, But God's Spirit, which is upon us, will no longer depart from us, Arise, shine, for the light of God will come. The glory of the Lord will rise upon you. Times of darkness may cover the earth, and thick darkness may be upon all people. But the Lord will arise, and glory will be seen upon you. Lift up your eyes around about and see. Let us pray. Father, we talk too much. And in our talking so much, we miss out on the beauty of people that are around us. We get too caught up in each other's opinions. We miss out on the worth of each other around us. We get too caught up on people's positions. Help us that we might be quieter. And, oh God, help us to understand that we talk too much to you. And we don't give you enough of an opportunity to be able to surround us with your presence. And to know that if we are in your presence, that you will help and sustain us. So help us that we might find ways in our own prayer lives and our own devotion to practice the presence of you as our God. Help us that we might not be so consumed with wanting prayers answered. Help us that we might not be so consumed with wanting explanations. Help us that we might not be so consumed with having to understand. Help us that we might be quiet and allow the life of you that is there in the midst of the world, even when it is darkest, to find its way to surfacing in our lives. 
Help us, our Father, that we might find ways to not say a mumbling word so that you might speak. We ask our prayer in your Son's name. Amen. Thank you all for coming today.